Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to session 11 of our study of Revelation, Unveiled Hope. We're all the way to the very end of Revelation. The good to, part. Yeah, the <laughs> best part. It's where history is headed. Last Sunday, we looked at uh, the New Jerusalem uh, in chapter 21, and today is chapter 22, the very last words of the last book of the Bible, uh, where it's all headed. So uh, I wanted to start off by asking you if, uh, what questions do you have about Revelation that we haven't talked about so far? Are there any things that, you know, as you've been reading Revelation over the years and have, uh, or, you know, this time through, uh, are there other questions that have come up for you that we haven't talked about yet? I know we've packed a lot in <laughs> in these 11 sessions here. But if you think of things, even any, any time along here, uh, please let me know and we'll, we'll try and look, look at them. That's uh, actually the biggest thing. For us growing up, we didn't stress so much the heaven coming to earth. Yes, yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? So often and we've just more talked so about more us going to heaven. Yeah. Yeah, but that's yeah. not where the story ends. I you know, am. that heaven comes yeah. here. So, you know, we always thought you know, we're going up to heaven. Right, right. We'll be destroyed, you know, but... But you know, this is God's good creation. Yeah. He's not going to abandon it. Yeah. You know, and that's... See, that agrees with what I had a conversation on the phone with a lady who is a Jehovah's Witness. Okay. And she said, why would you want to go to heaven if you're going to have heaven here on earth? Yeah. They right. They all it. Yep. And we always question that when they said to you for our door and pull us in, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it all makes sense. I think so it's what they stress. For example, one of those hymns I'm doing in the German Christmas carol sing along, one of the uh, two, one of the verses says, um, God is here, heaven is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so heaven, if you, you can think of heaven as kind of being like, God's dimension. You know, we can't find heaven by looking through a telescope. Yeah. You know, it's not out beyond the Milky Way. Uh, it, you know, it's God's presence. It's where God dwells. In fact, it, it's like, you know, in the beginning, there was only God. And then God had to, you know, God wanted to create something outside himself. And so it's like he had to carve out an area that was not him or create kind of a different dimension where we live. And, and I think maybe we always, at least I did, relate it when we hear, as I went through school and at home, my teaching, Jesus ascended into heaven. Right. And that's, I think, how I always felt yeah. like heaven was. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. So, you know, and, and that makes sense for, especially back in Jesus' day, and, you know, more primitive cultures, they only had a sense of, uh, you know, we live here on the earth, and when we die, we get buried in the ground. So, the ground is, like, bad. <laughs> That's the bad place to go down. And rain comes from the sky and we get the sun shining on us from the sky and so those must be the heavens you know and so the gods send rain from you know from the heavens and so we, we have to pray to the gods who are up there but nowadays we realize that the earth isn't flat <laughs> it's a sphere and that it's going around the sun and there are all these you know the stars are not just little lights strung up in the sky they are galaxies and star you know stars at unimaginable distances but you can't find god by looking through you know even the hubble space telescope <laughs> god is outside of this creation and yet, he also lives in our hearts, comes to dwell in us. And that's what he longs for, is for us to 
to be restored to a relationship with him. So the only ones that are in heaven are the ones that die before he comes? Right now, yeah, yeah. So, um, the soul, right? Yeah. So, so like when Jesus, uh, <laughs> when Jesus was on the cross, he said to the thief next to him who believed in him, he said, "Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise." So, paradise, you know, is is a way of understanding the presence of God, and that points back to how things were in the very beginning. When God created everything, everything that he created, he looked at it, he looked at it and said, this is good. And then he made humans and said, these are good. And he walked with them in the garden of Eden. Now heaven and earth were one at that point where he you know, dwelled with his people. But then what happened? Things went south. Yeah, yeah I think I shared last uh, one of these uh, times that you know if you take sin out of the Bible, <laughs> you have the first two chapters <laughs> before the fall, and you have the last two chapters where God makes all things new and restores things to where it, 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 His original intention was. Well, you know what I when you just said about those who have died have gone to heaven. Right. What about then they say the people will rise from the grave? Mm-hmm. The yes. Dead shall rise. And that's so the, the, and that's the resurrection. Right? Yeah. So it's where we will be reunited with our restored, uh, glorified body. Yeah. Body and soul. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll yeah. The, the human beings are not you know, a soul encased in a little flesh, <laughs> you know, thing. Uh, it's, it's much more um, holistic than that. You know, that um, our, our bodies and souls are meant to be together. We're, we're all one. Uh, it's not something that you can just easily, you know, divide. You can't, you know, look with a microscope inside a person and find, oh, there's where the soul is. <laughs> it's, uh, we're, but somehow, when we die, we go to be with the Lord. That's what Paul said, you know, that when he was nearing the end of his life, he said, I'm, I'm torn, you know, I want to go and, you know, and be with the Lord. That's, that's better. But I know that if I stay and I'm still here with you, that it'll be helpful for you. And so I want to do what's helpful for you. <laughs> so heaven is God's presence. And those who die in the Lord are with the Lord. Uh, and one day we will be reunited with those who've gone before us in faith. We'll have new bodies that won't, there won't be disease or decay or death. And the world will be restored the way God always intended it to be. <laughs> We're not going to be floating around on clouds with harps. <laughs> it's all going to be restored and made the way it's always supposed to be. Could we call it another dimension? Yeah. So much about yeah. That right. Um, uh, there's a, a great Bible project video. Um, I think maybe we watched that, the one on heaven and earth. Um, you can find that on their website or just on YouTube. Just type Bible Project Heaven and Earth. Uh, and, and in that, they talk about uh, it's kind of like God's dimension and our dimension. And at times they overlap. Uh, you know, like when it, at the temple, for example, that was where people would go to be in God's presence. But Jesus declared that he would tear down the temple and raise it up in three days. What temple is he talking about? Himself. That he is the new temple. That in him, heaven and earth meet. And he's the one who's going out. And in that video, he, it's like he invades earth with his presence, with God's presence. He heals people. 
sets them free from disease and from um, demons and death uh, and declares the kingdom of God, the presence of God, has come near. And so that's what Revelation, the end of Revelation, is all about. God's kingdom coming is uh, here on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven and earth being reunited. <coughs> Any other opening questions? <coughs> All right, let's dive in. <coughs> grab your Bibles, or if you don't have one, you can grab one from the table back there. We're going to look and read our way through this <coughs> final chapter. Somebody read uh, the ver first five verses. <coughs> Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nation. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there, no need for lamp or sun. For the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. <coughs> All right. So he sees the city, and what's flowing out from God's throne? Life. What's it? Yeah, the river the of the water of life. Yeah. Uh, a lot of fruit trees. Yes. And we won't have to trim them. There'll be fruit trees. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? We don't have to trim them. Yeah. Don't, so so yeah. don't have to spray them with DDT anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no more weeds. <laughs> yeah. So, how is the water of life described here? Crystal. Yeah, as bright as crystal. And where is it flowing from? God. Yeah, from God's throne, and it flows right through the middle of the city. Uh, and this this is an echo from um, Ezekiel. In Ezekiel, he talks about the river of the water of, li of uh, the water of life flowing out from the throne of God, uh, and that everywhere it flows, there's lush vegetation that comes up. It turns the desert into a, a garden. And it flows you know, into the Jordan River. And it flows down to the Dead Sea. You know, what do you know about the Dead Sea? Yeah. Water only goes in and so it's so salty that it is completely dead. But in Ezekiel he talks about the water flowing down and making the Dead Sea fresh and there being life teeming in the sea and all around it. What do you notice here about um, what, what, what's growing on either side of, this, of the river? Yeah, the tree of life. Now where have we heard of the tree of life before? Garden of Eden. Garden of Eden. This is Eden restored. And you can eat from it. Yes, yes. God said to Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree of the garden except which one? Tree of the, life. You know, the, the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat from that tree. They could have eaten from the tree of life. And so that tree won't be there. <laughs> the knowledge of good knowledge and evil. Of good <laughs> He talks of, yeah, because that tree was there to test them. You know, would they obey his one command? No more. Don't touch this one. <laughs> uh, because it's not going to be good for you. Because what had they known before that? Before they reached out for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, what did they know about? They only knew about the good. So they wanted to know what evil was, and things 
only went south from there. It's like they wanted to decide for themselves what was good and what was evil. You know, and when we when we try to decide for ourselves what's good and evil, rather than letting God judge what's good and evil, then we mix things up. He gave him a choice and still does, doesn't he? Right. Yep. He gives us a choice. Yep. But here, in Revelation 22, the tree that is growing on both sides of the, you know, it's like one continuous tree, um, or maybe, maybe like those um, those trees that send out, you know, roots and the new ones come up all the way along. You can just imagine like a canopy on both sides. And and what about uh, what about, about the trees? The leaves. The leaves. Yeah, yeah. They be used for medicine. And right. Right. So in Ezekiel, he talks about the tree of life, that uh, its leaves are for healing, uh, and that it brings forth. You know, it's it's like an ever-bearing tree. Here, it's bearing different crops every month. Twelve different kinds of fruit on one tree. Uh, so it's continually bearing fruit. And its leaves are not just for healing, it's for the healing of the nations. That the nations will be healed by the leaves of this tree. Yeah. 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 The medicines are made from these trees at least. It's amazing. Yeah. It's it's about God's presence healing every hurt, every pain, you know, uh, making it so that the nations no longer fight against one another. So it, it's this beautiful um, fulfillment of what Ezekiel saw, only way bigger. <laughs> Not just healing, but healing the nations. Not just, you know, providing uh, water that provides life around it, but that even has the tree of life growing alongside. Eden is being restored. Um, one of the handouts that I gave you today has on it a, a little chart. tale of two cities, you could call it. Uh, the difference between Babylon and the New Jerusalem. Because uh, you remember Babylon was pictured as this woman, you know, this prostitute on the beast. And um, there's all these different descriptions throughout Revelation of what happens to pretty much any civilization that looks to themselves and tries to build themselves up. You know, from Babel to Egypt to Assyria to Babylon to Rome to us, <laughs> uh, to modern day Israel, to the Arab nations. Any time that we rely on our own power and strength and economic uh, you know, powerhouse uh, and look to ourselves for all good, we end up falling back into the same traps that the people of Babel and Babylon and Egypt all and Israel did. Um, when you have power, you do anything to hold on to. Uh, so. All the we're, we're not going to take time to, to look at all of them today, but this that chart has all of the references to uh, the description in Revelation of Babylon, the harlot, who gets splendor from exploiting other people and who corrupts the nations uh, who you know, 
seek wealth from her. And she's described as being full of impurity and deception. She makes the nations drunk on sin. In chapter 21 and 22, there is all the, a contrasting image of the new Jerusalem, of the bride. You know, that she, the bride of Christ, comes down out of heaven from God. And she gains her glory, not from exploiting other people to gain glory, but receives glory from God. Instead of the nations being corrupted by seeking wealth from her, the bride, you know, the, the nations walk in its light and bring their glory to her. Instead of being full of impurity and deception, in the New Jerusalem, nothing impure or false will be found there. And instead of making the nations drunk on sin, what flows through her streets are the water of life and the tree of life to the healing of the nations. I want to show you a video from Bible Project. Uh, some of you may have seen this one already, uh, but I think it's really important for us to revisit it um, as we're looking at the Tree of Life, uh, which is kind of the bookends to the Bible. But there's the Tree of Life in Eden, and then there's the Tree of Life in the New Jerusalem. The story of the Bible begins in a garden, where God and humans live together. And the biblical authors want us to see this garden as a type of temple. The top is the most sacred place, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence is most intense. And that's where we find the Tree of Life. So, what's this tree all about? Well, it represents God's own life and creative power that is made available to others. In fact, God's first command is that humans eat from all of the trees, including this one. So you're ingesting God's own life. That sounds intense. Yeah, this meal transforms the one who eats it. Or in the words of the story, it leads to eternal life. Okay, but on the way to the tree of life, the humans have to pass by another tree called the tree of knowing good and bad. And God says that eating from this tree will kill you. How does it do that? Well, it represents taking the authority to do what is good in your own eyes. And when humans do that, it leads to broken relationships, violence, and death. And so here's the thing. Both trees look beautiful, but one of them is a false tree of life. And the humans take from this false tree of life. And they're exiled from the garden for good. Which raises the question, can anyone ever get back to the tree of life? Well, later on in the story, we meet a man named Moses, and he encounters God in a desert tree on top of a mountain. Or you mean the burning bush, where Moses is told that he's standing on holy ground. Yeah, it's a plant on a mountain radiating with God's life and power, just like the tree of life. And God tells Moses, bring your people up to this mountain so we can form a partnership. And this partnership will force them to make a choice. Will they follow gods of their own making, or receive life from the true God? And in this story, they give their allegiance to an idol. And it's just the first of many. The story goes on to show generation after generation choosing gods of their own making. And these idols were usually placed on tall hills like beautiful trees. But they're false trees of life that lead the people into self-destruction, exile, and death. It's like death's grip on us is too strong to resist. Is there any hope? Well, let's turn now to the story of Jesus. He came to announce that God's eternal life was available once again through him. So Jesus thinks of himself as the tree of life. Yes, this is what he meant when he claimed to be the vine that brings God's life into the world. And Jesus invited people to eat from him. Yeah, he was inviting people to trust him and be transformed by his life. But Jesus also exposed how corrupt humans are, how much they love false trees of life. 
And so Jesus presented people with a new choice between life or death. And this time, they don't just choose death. They also chose to attack the one who sustains all of life. Yes, Jesus is led up to the top of a hill where he dies upon a tree. The cross is the sad and violent result of humanity's desire to do what is good in our own eyes. The tree of life has been overcome by the power of death. Well, it seems that way. But Jesus said that he was a seed of God's life that would die in the ground, but then grow into a plant that would bear much fruit. So to defeat death, Jesus went through it. And now this new tree of life stands before us all. We can eat from it, but it will mean passing through death like Jesus, allowing our old way of being human to die. So that a new humanity can grow in its place. Yes, Jesus said he is the vine and we are his branches. So not only do you eat from this tree, you're invited to become a part of it, helping produce its fruit so that his life and love can spread through us to others. And so the story of the Bible ends in a new garden which is also a kind of temple, with the tree of life at its center, providing healing and life forever to all who choose to eat from it. What did you find interesting in that video? What echoes did you hear? Yeah, it's the same word. Bush and tree are one word. In the story of the Bible in, uh, in Hebrew. And the cross. Yeah, and so often the cross is described as a tree, that he hung upon the tree. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, that they intended as this horrible death and, and humiliation. And yet, through his death, Jesus conquered death, rose from the grave as the first fruits uh, of a much greater harvest. That he said, unless a, unless a seed dies and, and put in the earth, then when it does, then it produces, it grows and produces much fruit. Uh, and that's what he's doing in us. He calls us to die to ourselves, to our selfishness uh, and greed, and to be united with him, uh, to, to go through a kind of death and new life. That's, that's really what baptism is all about, remembering our baptism on a daily basis, dying to our, you know, our old selves and rising to the new self, which is made more and more like him, to abide in him, to be part of the tree of life that extends healing to all those around us, to the nations. What else did you find interesting from that video? I like how it, the tree at the end turns into a cross. Yes. That's yes. Yeah, yeah, and then there's all these false trees of life, all the way, you know, from fruit of the knowledge of good and evil to you know, the lure of empire and wealth and, you know, security through military oppression and all these different things. But the cross is where God meets us. puts to death all of our instruments of death. Let's go on and, uh, oh, actually, well, let's see here. Is there anything else from that one? Um, yeah, how can you recognize a false tree of life? that isn't lasting? Yeah. It's something that's put ahead of us, right? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Something, something that gets in your in the way of your relationship with him. Yeah. Right? Yep. 
that if you if you if you can imagine Jesus saying to you, this particular thing that you're doing, or this thing that you have your your heart set on, that's getting in the way of you and me. That addiction, that um, particular sin, um, that's getting in the way. It needs to be put to death. You know, as we're all sinners, especially when you're young, you got that drive to get ahead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Get ahead and yep. get as much as you can. Right. And as you get older, it starts to start become mm. meaningless after all. Right. Yeah. That was what the writer of Ecclesiastes yes. found. Yes. You know, he tried chasing after so, uh, happiness, prosperity, projects, women, uh, you know, relationships. Um, all these different things and found it was all meaningless. It was like grasping after wind. Because <laughs> the only thing that truly sustains and satisfies is God, His presence, His life. A lot of times you don't recognize it right away and you have to go through it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Flip through it and see. Yep. So, so the tree, same more, I haven't been there, so what, uh, say more about what that tree of life at the well, animal kingdom is. Well, it gives you, it correlates with the uh, Lion King movies. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, uh-huh. being that there's always a real Oh, like the of cycle life. of life. Cycle of life. Sure, sure. There, there's and, and there's, there's a park, there's a huge tree of life kind uh-huh. of Okay. That you can take a picture of, people stand in front of it, and yeah. Look yeah. at all and then think, oh boy, this is the big, big to do thing here, uh-huh. you know, and uh-huh. photo moment. And I just look at it and I'm going, no, it's not the <laughs> real thing. The real tree of life is Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have people from all other countries coming and just flocking to see this tree of life. Uh-huh. It's like, no. <laughs> Spectacle, yeah, yeah. So there's all kinds of false trees of life there that don't ultimately satisfy. You know, it's just a picture <laughs> of an incomplete picture of the true life that we find in Christ. Well, let's go on. Uh, who wants to read verses 6 through 15? The angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God who inspired the prophets, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy written in this scroll. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I had heard and seen them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had been showing them to me. But he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of this scroll. Worship God. Then he told me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this scroll because the time is near. Let the one who does wrong continue to do wrong. Let the vile person continue to be vile. Let the one who does right continue to do right. And let the holy person continue to be holy. Look, I am coming soon. My reward is with me, and I will give to each person according to what they have done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may go through the gates into the city. Outside are the dogs, those who practice magic arts, sexually immoral, the murderers, 
the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. So what catches your attention in those verses? What sticks out for you? One that always confuses me is where he said, I will reward you for the good deeds you have done. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yet, I still have this problem for not saved according to our deeds. Right. Yep. That yep. still always confuses me. Yeah. Well, you know, um, last week we heard the story, or recently we heard the story of the parable of the talents mm -hmm. where you know, he entrusts to his the ser his servants um, his you know, all of his property right. you know massive amounts of money and some of them put it to work and um, produce more and afterwards he says well done you've been faithful in a few things <laughs> I gave you three million dollars you made three million dollars more <laughs> You were faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you now in charge of many things. Uh, so it's not so much that we earn our salvation by what we do with what's been entrusted to us. Otherwise, none of us would really live up to that. <laughs> but God promises that in the new creation, there will still be work to do. Uh, and he will put us in charge of many things, and we will enter into the joy of our Master. Does that help, or does that not quite get at what you're... It's hard to comprehend. Really I know, I know. It yeah, because our, our works do not save us. We are saved by God's grace alone, His love, His unmerited favor. Um, you know? It's but almost like, yes, I know I'm going to go to heaven, but yet he'll put me, but you know what? I, don't know. <laughs> I always say it's good enough for me just to get there. <laughs> that's, that's you wonder. And that's the thing. It's <laughs> the thing. You know, we're, when everything is made new and brought back into alignment and made fresh and clean and without disease and decay, that's going to include us, too. Not just our transformed bodies, but our transformed hearts. Uh, God says over and over in Scripture, I am going to give you a new heart uh, that worships me alone. Yeah. No worries, no worries. Yeah. If when you're in heaven, everything is perfect, then why do you need the tree of life for healing of the nations? Isn't that interesting? Uh, I know we'll find out when we get yep. there. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's it's part of uh, it, maybe it's a process. <laughs> maybe it's not going to be instantaneous, you know, but there's going to be still work to do of setting things right. I mean, think about all of the wrongs that have been done to people by other people throughout history. That's a big snarl that's going to take a while to unravel. Mm -hmm. yeah. And go kind of going back to what Sandy was talking about, not to wait till the last minute, but when we think of the um, criminal on the cross, yeah. for his soul, he's being hung for right. all the bad he's done, mm -hmm. but Jesus says mm -hmm. today you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah, because he looked to Jesus and trusted him and said, remember. You know, all he said was, remember me. <laughs> and Jesus gives him way more than that. He says, truly I tell you, you'll be with me today in paradise, in the presence of God. He could see his heart. That's right. That's right. And, and he, he just turned and looked in Jesus. Yep. He didn't you know, do all these great things for him. He just trusted him. What else from those verses? Since the start of the angel talking in John 11, yep. it seems like the text switches and it's Jesus talking to John. 
Right. Yeah, yeah. So in so verse um, sixteen, he was his cup. Right, right. And twelve as well. So yeah, if it's the angel speaks through um, verse eleven. He said, you know, he says, first of all, John tries to worship him. He's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm not God. <laughs> don't worship me. <laughs> uh, don't seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. Uh, you know, the time is near. Uh, but then in verse 12, it shifts to Jesus speaking. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for, he has done, for what he has done. Uh, I am the Alpha, or actually, no, this, this is God speaking. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Will there still be angels? Oh, no, that, that is Christ. That is Christ speaking. Yeah. Will there still be angels? Oh, yes. In heaven, in the new Absolutely. Still Absolutely. Be they are some of heaven. God's, you know, an ang the, the word angel um, literally is messenger. So, they are God's messengers. They're you know, we have this false idea that um, when you die, uh, you become an angel. <laughs> you know, oh, you know, God needed another angel in heaven, and so that's why He took your loved one. No, <laughs> the angels are totally different beings. They are angelic warriors, part of the host of the heavenly armies. Yeah, so. Revelation talks over and over about the angels and the elders and these living beings and all these other creatures that we don't even know about um, that are part of God's creation. We're the lions who lay next to the lamb. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. When all is made... We don't have to worry about the snakes anymore. <coughs> <laughs> they probably got beat then. <laughs> I think that they were created originally with snakes. What makes you think that? Because oh. then afterwards, when sin was brought in, yeah, they yeah. were told that they oh, will crawl on their crawl belly forever. Belly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, interesting. Yeah, I think they were because for, for us it, it doesn't quite make sense because we we're like. Uh -uh. So you've cursed him to always slither on the ground? Isn't that what snakes already do? <laughs> I saw a thing on television once where they were going through the snake, different snake's anatomy. Uh -huh. And some of them do have what looked like at one time had been hip bones. Uh -huh. Interesting. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> look now on that other sheet that I gave you. On the back of it is another um, kind of chart that compares Ezekiel and Revelation. Uh, again, we don't have time to go through. You can on your own uh, look all these different things up. Uh, but so many things in the prophet Ezekiel and the other prophets are fulfilled here in Revelation. Uh, you know, in Ezekiel 37, uh, we see the graves open and the dead come to life. Uh, and in Revelation uh, chapter 20, we saw the same thing that uh, God raises everyone up. Uh, chapter 37 talks about the dwelling of God. And chapter 21, the New Jerusalem is the presence of God. Uh, chapter 38 of Ezekiel talk about uh, the armies of Gog and Magog coming to uh, afflict the people of Israel. And that's mentioned in Revelation 20 as well, but described differently. Same thing with the, the horrible banquet of the birds. You know, that was in Ezekiel 39 and in Revelation 19, you know, where God the rider uh, on the white horse who is faithful and true, Jesus, he defeats them, but what's the one weapon used in that battle? His word. His word the sword from his mouth. Uh, so it's a totally different kind of battle than we 
normally think of when we think of Armageddon and you know, so forth. Uh, it's not going to be napalm and nuclear missiles. The only weapon mentioned in Revelation 19 is the word of God. Killing and making new. And the way it's done, he's not going to be talking long either. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in Ezekiel 40, an angel measures the city, uh, just like in Revelation 21. Uh, in Ezekiel 43, the glory of God is manifest in the new city. And we see that fulfilled in Revelation 21. Um, Ezekiel 47 is what I described earlier about the, the water the li of life flowing from the throne of God uh, and that the tree of life is growing. Uh, you know, not in, but in Revelation 22, it's not just trees, but the tree of life, you know, the Eden is restored. Uh, Ezekiel 48 describes 12 gates for the 12 tribes, and in Revelation 21, same sort of thing, but on a bigger scale. You know, the dimensions in Ezekiel are, you know, that the, the city uh, is one and a half miles, or uh, 12 stadia uh, in e every direction. Long and wide and high. But in Revelation, it's 12,000 stadia in every direction. 1,500 miles in every direction, but the 12 times 1,000 is this bigger symbolic number of completeness of the 12 tribes, the 12 disciples that Jesus chose. It will probably cover the whole earth, yeah. not just Jerusalem. Right, right, yeah. This, you know, it's, it's much more than just a... <laughs> A, a cube city. <laughs> One thing is too is, is that on uh, each side of the river grew mm -hmm. a tree of life. Right. So is right. that a dividing line? Is going to be between from heaven somehow? Or no, no. It's 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 that it's, it's 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 all along the banks. Oh. You know, maybe it's going to be kind of like mangroves <laughs> that are you know okay. one okay. continuous. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and, and we're going to be part of that. Yeah, we're going to be part of that. All right. Um, so there's there's not really kind of a neat chronological <laughs> sequence um, to, you know, because all of these promises in Ezekiel get woven together in a revelation. Not in a, this happens and this happens and this happens. But it's a resounding yes to all of God's promises in way, you know, way bigger than the expectation. Uh, in the last few verses of uh, Revelation 22, uh, Jesus says, I have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendants of David, the bright and morning star. So, isn't that interesting that he is David's descendant, but he's also the root that David grew out of. He is the original family tree. You know, that uh, that all of humanity came from. Uh, and he says, The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without price. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life in the holy city which are described in this book. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's how we are to live uh, expectantly uh, and prayerfully, uh, anticipating that it could be any day. I know a pastor who has a, a little plaque on his desk uh, that just says, perhaps today. That's how we are to live. Well, next week we are going to 
have the uh, one final class on this. Um, but instead of it being a class, it is going to be readings and songs from Revelation. So uh, we're going to kind of draw it all together, give kind of a sweeping panorama of the whole book in one uh, collection of readings from Revelation and songs woven out of it. So I need three people to help with reading next week. I have all of the <coughs> the, the parts here. Uh, so who would be interested in being one of the readers for that next week? Well. Martha, would you like to be one? Will you be here next week? So yeah, we'll have we'll have uh, four readers that take turns reading. Uh, we'll have uh, we'll, we'll probably we'll, we'll move things around in here so we can all kind of be up front here, and then uh, there will be songs all the way through. That Tim will come and and play for us, uh, and we'll sing the Book of Revelation together. Have a great week, everyone, and see you soon.